if you remember back to earlier lectures, we said it was in 1860 that the British decided to assert sovereignty over New Zealand. Now, during this period, we had the British and Maori who engaged in serious warfare. By 1869, Maori were defeated. Now, Maori's defeat involved the usual costs, and we also have a kind of lowered morale. Lowered morale because we've suffered a loss. Loss also entailed another consequence. It's what we refer to as a reduced political cohesion. It became more difficult for Maori to resist the imposition of British law. It became more difficult for Maori to resist the loss of land through punitive land confiscations that were sanctioned by law. For example, the New Zealand Settlements Act 1863. If you read the act, you see that any Maori could have, any iwi could have their land confiscated. So it wasn't simply Maori who engaged in rebellion. Yes, there was a specific provision there concerning those Maori. But you also had within this statute permission for the governor to confiscate any Maori land. So what the act gave the governor was the power to designate the land of Maori as a district. The declaration would extinguish all Maori customary title to the land, and the land would now be deemed crown land. So this land was designated a district, and the land was confiscated for purposes of settlement. Now despite this, Maori remained on the land. Their residency, if you will, was challenged when settlers and surveyors began to arrive. Te Fiti was position was, we're not going to engage in armed resistance, we are going to engage in passive resistance and demand to be left alone. Part of their program of passive resistance was to plow the land. The settlers, the surveyors, sent for government help. So in June, police were sent in to arrest the plowmen. The plowmen were arrested, and what happened? New plowmen came along and continued their program of passive resistance. By August, we had some 200 Maori who were already in custody. Now the plowmen, we have to be clear, did not resist arrest. Maori who were in custody posed a problem. They could not be charged with trespass. Trespass was not a criminal act. Trespass was only a matter that could be resolved via the civil courts. What does this mean then? What were they detained for? There was no crime they could be charged with. Why? Because they had not committed a crime. So what Parliament did was simply pass a law that retroactively made the arrests lawful. This law permitted Maori to be held without trial. What Parliament was doing was sanctioning, was condoning indefinite detention. So what Parliament was doing was suspending the rule of law as we know it. It's interesting to note if you, turn, if you uh, examine paragraph 6, that the act only applied within the confiscated territory. It was a localized law targeting a specific group of people. One thing about the rule of law is that one is meant to have fair notice about which behaviors are lawful versus which behaviors are unlawful. So the problem with retroactive lawmaking, any action can later become criminal. Meaning I'm guilty for something that is deemed a crime today but was not a crime when I committed the act. So there was no way for me to know that what I was doing was going to be later judged criminal. So in 1881, the government, government troops invaded Parihata. Te Fiti and another chief, Tohu, were brought to trial. But once again, it was not clear <coughs> what criminal act they had in fact committed. So Parliament passed what was known as the West Coast Peace Preservation Act, 1882. And this law was specifically for Te Fiti and Tohu. 
Now, the act authorized the indefinite detention of Tefiti and Tohu without any charge. This is an example of what we identify as ad hominem legislation. What is worrisome about ad hominem legislation? Um, it doesn't follow the law. Okay, so we look at it and we say here that the law as we understand it is meant to apply equally to all. In this case, the law is singling out two individuals because of who they happen to be. This is a violation of the rule of law, which says that laws are meant to apply generally to all. What is worrisome about arbitrary detention? So if you look at it and you say that within our society, we have a presumption of liberty. And we accept certain parameters, certain limitations on our freedom. But we accept these limitations so long as they apply to everyone. Arbitrary detention imposes a very harsh penalty. We are taking away someone's freedom, but we're taking it away without any proof of criminal liability. No one has provided any evidence that the person has engaged in a criminal act, yet they are having their liberty taken <coughs> away. Is there any contemporary relevance to this topic? Guantanamo Bay. So we know that since the World Trade Centers went down, we've had many states that have passed many laws which permit the indefinite detention of individuals for acts of terrorism. But is it for acts of terrorism or is it for something else? The suspicion of terrorism. Suspicion of. Now I'm asking specifically about what's happened over just the last few years so that we can see that the historical record is not merely a historical record, but rather is a pattern. And it's a pattern of behavior that extends to today. And we know this because we look to terrorism laws. And what do these acts have in common? It's trying to suppress something that's perhaps not proven. Mm. So we see this and we have to ask ourselves, what proof is being provided for the suppression of particular behaviors? The actions of governments are in fact in breach of many of the basic rights, rule of law, due process, these things that we take for granted. Now in the case with indefinite detention, they never go through that process. So how is it that we can label this person a terrorist? Fear is a very important factor. Fear is an extremely important factor. So I remember after the World Trade Center went down and I was at the airport and trying to travel, I say trying, <laughs> you all know my name. <laughs> <laughs> trying to travel and hearing on the speakers, code orange, court over orange. And what this is doing is creating a situation of fear. And then when people are afraid, then we're more willing to surrender <coughs> certain liberties. We know, and this is what's most interesting, is the Patriot Act has in fact been used in the United States <coughs> against environmentalists and animal rights activists. And we get away with it, governments get away with it, because people are afraid. And when we're, we're afraid, we surrender our liberties. We surrender our freedoms in exchange for a kind of protection. If you've ever been to a desert, to navigate through the desert, you need to know three things. You need to know where you were, where you are, and where you're headed. Why? Because there's a whole bunch of sand around you, and all the sand looks the same. And if all you do is look at where you want to go, then you're just going in one direction, and then you get somewhere, and you look around, and everything looks the same. So you have to come up with a trajectory. Figure out where you were, where you are, and where you're headed. You can map a course, and that will actually take you somewhere. Now when it comes to law, when it comes to history, when it comes to society, it's essentially the same thing. Now many of you did not know the story of Tefiti and Tohu. Many of you don't even know the story of Ahmed Zawi. 
Some of you do know Akhenzal. And you know that he was detained for how long? For a year. Five years. Two years in solitary. Where? It's not in Guantanamo. In New Zealand. Here. For five years. With no charge and no trial. So we don't need to go back to 1882 to see this happening. We just need to go to 2004. And we don't need to look at Big Bad America and Guantanamo. We need to look here. So when you see that historically you did something, we say that was wrong. And then we look to today and we say, we're afraid of something. What are we going to do? Let's behave in the exact same way we did 100 years ago. If we look to the history, if we see that there was behavior, reprehensible behavior, that we now frown upon, that we now condemn, then a good way to move forward, if we're interested in getting somewhere different from where we were, is to behave differently. So why I'm telling you this is not to preach to you something about how the law should be, but rather for you to think critically about the materials, the topics that we're studying in class. Yes, this is a lot of legal history. But to understand where New Zealand is headed, you must know where New Zealand was. And only then can you figure out how to map a trajectory that is going to get us somewhere better than where we are.